The Adich Agus Falcha. Hello and welcome. My name is Paula de Fougerol. I am a medieval historian and the author of the historical fiction series, The Chronicles of Iona, which tells the untold true story of the two men who in the sixth century founded the great monastery of Iona and the nation kingdom of Scotland, an exiled Irish abbot, Columcilla or St. Columba, and a Scottish warlord, Aidan McGabran. It has been my great honor and pleasure to be asked by the Donegal County Library Service to be part of Calmkill 1500, this year-long celebration of the 1500th anniversary of the birth of the great Donegal Saint, Calmkilla. And now to share the work that I do and the books that I write as part of Donegal's National Heritage Week with this lecture for the Calmkill Books and Beyond series of talks. I was asked to speak about the literary heritage of St. Columcilla, in particular the saint's close association with books and the literary world, and the thought of that sprang to mind immediately and unerringly, and if you'll excuse a medieval metaphor, like an arrow from a bow, was how to the early medieval people the written word, the act of physically capturing what has or can be spoken, of containing in ink on parchment or on paper, how in a very real sense to them, this trapped whatever kind of magic happened to be inherent in that word's meaning and its form. After all, in the beginning was the word. Words carry in them all creation and from them things burst into life, not just in the mind, but also in form in the physical world. So we'll talk more about that later, but in preparing this lecture for today, I decided that what I would also now like to add as an addendum to the title, like a skewing or a honing, is to talk not just about the magic in Columbus words, but also the power. Because what makes Cullen Kill's literary heritage so remarkable, so enduring, and so important is ultimately the uses mostly for the good, it seems, thankfully, but the uses to which his own words, as well as those words written about him, have been put by the rest of us over time. Therein lies their power down the ages. In other words, if the potential inherent in a word is its magic, then what that word makes manifest is its power. Because we all speak into the void, for most of us, our words live in the sunlight for only a short, glorious time, and then they rather quickly wither and die. And that's probably as it should be. But a rare few produce an echo, a reverberation, a flowering. Things grow on from their words and their works, and so it was with Colum Killa. So to start, who was he? What do we know about him? And more, more importantly for our purposes here, how do we know what we know about him? Columcilla, as you probably know, one of the three patron saints of Ireland, along with Patrick and Bridget. He's the patron saint of Derry. He was born in Garton in County Donegal in about 521 AD, and he is without doubt one of Donegal's most famous sons, because he went on to become one of the most influential figures in Irish and British history. He was, uh, as we've said, an abbot, and a prince and an exile. He was a diplomat, he was a polyglot, he was a linguist, a writer, an historian, a founder of monasteries and other building works. He was an adventurer and an explorer. He was a saint and a statesman. And after a sudden, catastrophic, and very intriguingly, an unexplained excommunication from his beloved church, was exiled from Ireland in 563 to be given safe haven in a very unsafe part of the world in Dal Riada in what is now Argyll and the Isles in the west coast of Scotland. And from there he went on to found many monasteries, the most famous of course being Derry and Iona, from which Britain and then Europe was seeded with Christianity and learning. We know an awful lot about Columcilla thanks to what we call the first life of Columba. There were three, the Vita Sancti Columbae. It's a sort of biography written about him by his kinsman and successor, 
the ninth abbot of Iona, a man called Adavnon, who was writing in the 690s, so about a hundred years after Columkill's death. Now, while Adavnon assiduously collected and then scrupulously vetted all the sources and stories he could find about Iona's saintly founder, it's important to keep in mind that the life is not actually a biography as we know it, but is hagiography. That is, it's the um, it's a specific kind of historical writing intended to promote the cult of a saint. Saints' lives set out to prove a person's holiness and sanctity by laying out the proof of their virtues and the evidence for whatever miracles they were claimed to have performed while alive. As Adavnon says, his book is a proclamation of Columbus' profitable deeds, those held to be genuine. For our monasteries, the life or vita of the founder had an additional mundane but far more crucial job, and that was to promote the monasteries themselves as worthy institutions. The founder's life was the monastery's raison d'etre, as it were, its reason for existing, and it laid out why the monastery should continue to receive donations, that is, funding from powerful patrons, and why it should continue to attract what was often an astonishingly lucrative pilgrim trade. Columba was a saint, and his aura, his sanctity and holiness, continued to live, at, live on at the site of his death, in, in our case, on Iona. And in this way, Iona is Columba, and Columba is Iona, and the Vita proved it. Over time, it was precisely this spiritual legacy or heritage of Columbus that ensured that Iona became a premier place of pilgrimage throughout the Middle Ages. So much so that four Irish kings, eight Norse kings, and 48 Scottish kings are buried on Iona, including Kenneth MacAlpin, Duncan I, and Macbeth. Because where Columba lived and worked, or any place that he frequented in his life, even just the once, retained something of his sanctity. To be on Iona, or in Derry, or in Garton where he was born, or anywhere in those special locations in Donegal where later tradition said he worked, was to be close to him, was to benefit from his residual blessing. Where he had been is where you also wanted to be. And this particular kind of magic was created first and foremost through Columkill's own words and works, and then was promoted again through the written word, through the many permutations and iterations of his literary heritage over time. All these writings perpetuated his cult. They spread his magic. So, to reiterate, Arvita has an agenda and must be carefully interrogated when you're reading it for anything other than pure pleasure. But with this in mind, in terms of its usefulness as a primary source, how close it can get us to the time Columkill actually lived and what kind of person he really was, then luckily for us, Adavnon's Vita is absolutely first rate. It is head and shoulders above the hundreds of other saint, saints' lives that were written after it in imitation of it and in homage to it, because Adavnon himself was a first-rate scholar and historian. He tells us that he drew first and foremost on an earlier written account of Columbus's life, a book written by Kuvena the White, who was the seventh abbot of Iona, and he was writing in the 630s or 640s. So as a monk, he may very well have known Columkill himself. So this gets us very close in time to Columkill, who died in 597. So if you strip off the veneer of miracles, you can get very quickly to crucial and valuable core details about Columkilla and about Iona in the early medieval period. You can see the man behind the myth, and he is something to behold. As a man, Columkilla comes off as completely arrogant and entirely uncompromising, but he's also extremely compassionate and caring. He was clearly a person who liked to flout the rules, to challenge authority, and I think it gave him quite a perverse sense of pleasure. And he held himself resolutely above society's more petty norms. And this is one of the reasons why, for me, he's so much fun to write about, to try to bring 
to life because he must have been a very difficult person to have to live with but this far removed from him 1500 years on from him he is an absolute joy to spend time with he just makes me laugh and um, most importantly for what we're talking about today the Vita shows just how much Columba loved the written word he loved books Columba loved reading books and he loved writing books copying out those books that were most important for the monastery's work and as we shall see not only creating his own new and original compositions in those genres in which the Irish already excelled like poetry but also in creating entirely new kinds of writing new genres and he loved the literary life so much that he, is, he had his own private little writing cell, his own study or library known as the Turin Abba, which means the high place or mound of the abbot. And this, we think, was a small wooden building, um, and we believe that it was located on the little rocky hillock, which is just across from the main entrance of the later Benedictine Abbey of Iona. The abbey was built in the very early 13th century, it's begun in 1203, on the site that they believed, or probably still um, contained, Columbus' original 6th century church. And from that little writing hut on that little hillock, Colum Kill could see everything that was going on in his monastery by looking out the windows and the doors. He could see the main gate of the monastery. He might even been able to see over the vellum walls to Iona's main harbor so he could see who was coming and going from Iona. So it gave him a bird's eye view and control over his world. And he would spend a large part of his day there reading and writing. Now, I should say that that's, that little hillock is traditionally where we believe his writing hut was situated. Um, until very recently, just a little while ago, a few years ago, we had the most amazing news come out of the University of Glasgow and two archaeologists there, Dr. Ewan Campbell and Dr. Adrian Maldonado, who went down to Cornwall and spoke with the very eminent archaeologist, Dr. Charles Thomas, about the dig that he had performed on Iona in 1957, and they asked if he had any, anything left. And he pulled out of a box in his garage, if I'm remembering correctly, little lumps of charcoal that he had dug from that little hillock. And Dr. Ewan Campbell and Dr. Adrian Maldonado submitted that those samples to radiocarbon analysis. And what's so exciting is they date, they date to the period 540 to 650. Colm Kill died in 597, so this places a little building there just when Colm Kill was living and writing. So this was probably indeed the location of the tour and Abba. And if you'd like to know more about this, then do check out, there's an upcoming webinar that's going to be broadcast on September 8th by the archaeologist and cultural historian Peter Yeoman in association with Historic Scotland as part of the Scottish arm of Colm Kill 1500 in which he will pull together all of the recent advancements in our understanding of the earliest phase of the Monastery of Iona, that is Columbus 6th century phase. Now, um, to continue with the theme of his literary heritage, uh, as if he didn't have enough to do looking after his men both on Iona and the other monasteries he founded in Scotland and Ireland and going on diplomatic missions to the enemies of the Scots of Dalriada who had kindly adopted him and given him a new home on Iona or spreading Christianity into the wild lands of the pagan Picts. And that little cell, that little private writing room in his spare time, Cullum Killa, our historiographer, he went on to develop new kinds of writing. For instance, annals. An annal is a series of year-by-year -year notes about events important to the writer, and in our case, the Monastery of Iona. And the so-called Chronicles of Iona, um, after which I have named my series, was begun on Iona in the mid-6th century, possibly by Colm Kill himself. And that annal, the Chronicle of Iona, forms the core or spine of all other Irish annals and is the basis for almost all of our knowledge of the early history of Ireland and of Scotland. Also, writing in Irish as opposed to Latin, 
the oldest extant manuscript that we have in the Irish language, which is an illuminated Psalter of the late 6th or the early 7th century, which is known as the Cuthic or the Battler, and it has a wonderfully arcane and, and very powerful history. That is our earliest, earliest example of Irish writing, and it too was probably written on Iona, possibly by Columkill himself. And finally, manuscript illumination. The impulse to embellish manuscripts with illumination is something we see for the very first time in Columbus Cuthic. That little ornamentation there, that little doodle, is what we in the trade call the diminution. That's our early, earliest example of manuscript illumination, and it may well have been done in that little writing hut by Columkill himself as he was writing the Cuthic. We also think that two of the very earliest poems in Hiberno Latin, which was a very learned, very playful, and very stylized kind of Latin created by Irish monks between the 6th and the 10th centuries, may have been written by Columkilla. A poem called the Audiutur Laborantium, which means O oh, Help of the Laborer, and the Altus Prosator, the High Creator. So taken all together, that's an extraordinary literary output for anyone, let alone an exile sitting in a drafty little hut on a tiny little island on the edge of Europe in the worst century to be alive. And from those very humble beginnings, Iona grew to be a great center of manuscript and book production. Because of Columba, books that got written include, and these, I suppose, are the best known, best known examples of his literary heritage, the great gospel book, the Book of Duro, the Book of Kells, which was probably written on Iona in about 800. And those are just two examples among hundreds of manuscripts that have a connection to Iona. But also, there was a great a veritable flowering of folklore and legends and maledictions and blessings and prophecies. And for all of this, I do hope you will check out the other lectures that have been organized for this series, which will um, cover all the topics I've mentioned in more detail, as well as the excellent and very comprehensive bibliography put together by the Donegal County Library Service um, of works on Columkilla that are held in the Donegal Studies Collection. So now to the heritage part of this talk. What is a heritage? What is heritage? Specifically and rather unhelpfully, heritage is defined as that which can be inherited. It's a specific value possession or an allotted portion. So as at its most basic, heritage is a thing. It's a physical thing that we inherit. In this case, then, what remains of Columkill physically and tangibly in the landscapes of Ireland and Scotland, the actual artifacts, the graves, sorry, his grave, the books, the caves, the wells, the churches, anything that he touched or made or was created about him that still endures, that is his legacy, his inheritance. And you can trace these yourselves if you follow the wonderful St. Columba Trail, the Sleek Homkilla. It takes you to all the places associated with Columkilla in the north of Ireland and the west of Scotland, going from the coast of Donegal all the way up to Argyll. Now, obviously over time, the meaning of heritage has broadened and deepened to include more generally the values, traditions, culture, and artifacts handed down by previous generations. So it's a generational transference. And then by transference again, or perhaps by osmosis, to those values, activities, meanings, and behavior that we ourselves, as individuals, draw from the things which we've inherited. Now, these will be different for, for everyone. And that's the beauty of, I guess, the point of these kinds of myths and legends and stories and histories, which, after all, are also only another kind of fiction, and perhaps the most insidious kind, since they they seek to pass themselves off as irrefutable fact. But in, we each see in them and draw from them what we ourselves need to see and ultimately to learn in order to try to make sense and derive meaning from our own often illogical lives. They become our little fictions.
For me as a writer, what forms the basis of my fiction about Colm Kill is what made him different from his peers. Not those qualities he shared with his compatriots, but those qualities that set him apart. In an age that was outstanding, it was absolutely breathtaking in its utter cruelty. An age that reveled in the most perverse forms of barbarism. And to get a good sense of this, you need only have a cursory read of a book by the man who, minus the saintliness, was perhaps the contemporary closest to Colm Killa in his natural abilities and in the trajectory of his career, Gregory Bishop of Tours. He was an exact contemporary of Columba, and he was also an historian, and he wrote about his own experiences in the sordid courts of the Merovingian kings of Francia, France. His Libri Historiarum Decum, The History of the Franks, is an eye-opening, very sobering account of just how horrible it was to be alive then, how physically vulnerable most people were to crushing poverty and to the indiscriminate predations of others, as well as to the random in injuries and injustices of a hostile, utterly indifferent world. So seen in that light, in the light of what life was actually like in 6th century Europe, to me what really stands out about Colm Killa as quite extraordinary and a stark contrast to his contemporaries was his vast capacity for compassion. How he eschewed the traditional routes to power that were wholly open to him since he was very fortunate to be what was called redovna, that is king worthy or eligible to be king. A path upon which most of us would joyfully jump for who doesn't want fame and fortune and security and success adulation, underlings, power. He eschewed all of that in favor of a life designed to be of service to others, especially the less fortunate, the cast-offs and the outcasts, the institutionally unloved, the people society ignores now as then as without value. What's key is what his hagiographer Adavnan does not tell us, what he won't say about why Columkill was so summarily excommunicated from his beloved church and then exiled from Ireland. Columkill had himself to fight hard to overcome obstacles that, even though they seem to have been of his own making, would have reduced another man to hopelessness and to despair, to paralysis and to inaction. So it's not that he didn't suffer, he did suffer. But he seems to have used that spectacular fall from grace as the call to action in his own life, his wake-up call, his trumpeting angel. As Adavnan says, Columba was marked out as a son of promise in marvelous prophecy to be a bright light in the last days of the world. So Columkill was undoubtedly one of those special people who periodically come into the world at the great turning points of history, of which the early medieval period was definitely one, who incarnate to lead lives to help the rest of us poor souls remember that in the midst of our own unceasing suffering, because living, I mean, let's be honest, it can be very, very hard, that there is goodness to be had too, a sweetness to living, love. It is always there if we have but the eyes to see it. And if we can see it, then it is our primal, our, our primary responsibility to share it with others. Columkill's literary and linguistic legacy, the emanations, the inheritance that he, his own writings, and what has been written about him down the ages, that is rich and vast. Its branches spread everywhere. We still derive meaning from his life and works today. My books, everyone else's books and art, this week's series of talks, this year's series of celebrations. These are just the latest round of reassessments of the value of his life and his words. It's our generation's reappraisal of his legacy and his heritage. But let's say those didn't exist. None of those accretions. None of those layers. Let's say that the single thing that he managed to leave us as, as an inheritance of his life was an echo of a constant goodness, the memory of light, 
then that is a heritage, a magical, powerful heritage of which he can be, of which any of us should be, immensely proud. And to my mind, that's why we're still talking about him today. That's it for me for now. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to watch the other lectures organized for this week. They look to be excellent. And if you'd like to learn more about Cullum Killa as the man before the myth, then you can check out my books below. Slangafal, Agus Garev Mahagat. Goodbye and thank you.